Uh, my name is Mike Braun. I'm in the Department of Vertebrate Zoology. I've been here at the Smithsonian about 24 years now. I came uh, in the late 1980s along with uh, Rob Fleischer at the National Zoo and Biff Birmingham, who's at Stry, to try to bring molecular genetics uh, to the institution. And it's been a journey. So uh, the work I'd like to tell you about today is, uh, is really about phylogenetics, um, and there's, which is um, you know, one of the most common uh, areas of inquiry for our evolutionary biologists at the museum. Uh, and in, in these uh, phylogenies, there's a lot of great stories. And so I'm going to tell you about at least one of those today. If there's time, maybe two. Um, and I call this continental convergences because, well, you'll see why. Uh, I want to mention that there are many people involved in collecting the data that I'll talk about today. They're listed here, as well as analyzing the data, which is uh, both collecting and analyzing these data is a big job. Uh, the work was funded by two uh, large multi-investigator National Science Foundation grants from the Assembling the Tree of Life program. The first of those we called Early Bird because it was about trying to find out the early diversification of uh, the birds of the world. Uh, and when that grant started, about in 2003, this is our, our own estimate of what we actually knew, uh, the hard knowledge we had about the deep relationships of birds. And as you can see, we didn't know much. There were a few nodes in the avian tree of life resolved at the base, a few at the tips. Uh, the vast majority of the uh, relationships of modern birds uh, were basically not well understood at that point despite many decades of work on bird relationships. Birds, as you know, are uh, a group uh, that human beings are uh, intrinsically interested in. So, um, so after 10 years of work, we have uh, what I'll allege is a much better estimate of uh, the relationships of the birds of the world. It's still an estimate. We're still a lot of work to do, but it's cur our current estimate is based on 28 genes and the DNA sequences of 28 genes for 203 uh, avian lineages. And so this is the tree. It's unlabeled in tips. If it were labeled, you couldn't read the names of the birds. So uh, the point at this stage is just to say that all of these uh, yellow diamonds indicate nodes on the tree that we feel some, that we have fair confidence in, that we feel like there is some pretty good resolution at that stage. But you'll see there's still a lot of unresolved nodes in this tree. Uh, as I said at the beginning, though, these trees, while they get larger and more complex and a lot of work goes into them, you can get lost in the details of these trees. The reason why we are collecting these data and trying to infer these evolutionary trees is because there's really important lessons and really interesting stories about the history of life on Earth uh, embedded in these trees. And I'm going to talk to you about one of those now. Okay, and that uh, involves the birds that ornithologists call ratites. You all are familiar with these birds. They're the giant flightless birds like ostriches, emus, rheas, uh, the giant flightless birds of the southern continents. So biogeographers will recognize that they have a Gondwanan distribution, and it includes a number of extinct groups like the moas of New Zealand, the elephant bird, uh, and the extant kiwis of, uh, also of New Zealand. The traditional view, based on morphological studies of, for more than a century now, of, of paleognath relationships. So now the paleognaths are these ratite birds, the giant flightless birds, and they include one other living group, the tinamous, which is a group of small chicken-like birds of the neotropics that are able to fly. So these guys fly, none of the rest of these guys do. The traditional view of the relationships of this group had the ratite birds as monophyletic and the tinamous as their sister group. So from a tree with this structure, we would infer it would be most parsimonious to assume that, the, that flight was lost in the common ancestor of these birds. And that explains why all of these guys are flightless and these guys can fly like the, uh, the, uh, the ancestor of all birds, uh, of the you know, earlier ancestor of the, of the group. So, and uh, this traditional uh, view of paleognath relationships has been affirmed recently by more careful uh, morphological studies that were done by our own Dick Zussi in collaboration with Brad Livesey here at the museum. Uh, and they also, studying again the morphological uh, features of these birds, found the ratites to be monophyletic. And so again, we would infer a single loss of flight at this point. 
So this is an interesting, this brings up an interesting conundrum because if the common ancestor of these birds was flightless, then, one minute, uh, then we have to wonder how did they get to their current distribution on the southern continents? Because as I mentioned at the start, all of these birds live in far-flung areas of the southern continents. Uh, this, was a, this was a puzzle in evolutionary biology for many decades, but in the 1960s when we learned the, that continental drift, the, the reality of continental drift, uh, it seemed to provide an explanation for how these birds could get to where they are, to their current distribution. Uh, they may have drifted there on the southern continents. There were always, though, two problems with this explanation. First, that the a, there are no ratite fossils that are near as old as the divergences of these southern continents, and also that molecular estimates of the age of this radiation are much, much younger. When we now look at a more carefully derived molecular phylogeny of these birds, we find that instead of the ratites being monophyletic, we find the tenemus, this flying group, is actually nested up within the ratites. And so this prevents us from assuming that there could have been a single origin of flightlessness in the group. So instead, we have to assume from the, molecu from the morphological, I'm sorry, from the molecular phylogeny that flightlessness actually evolved repeatedly in this group. And that's actually more in line with both the fossil record and our estimates of the age of the group. Uh, and so it, the actual uh, history here may have been that the ratites flew to, the, to their current distributions and independently lost the ability to fly there. Thank you. Now, I'm just curious, is there any morphological evidence that uh, is congruent with some of these uh, nodes as supported by the molecular? Yeah, actually, there's a lot. So it's a, it's a it's a complicated story. But if you if you separate if you think about the uh, the kinds of convergences that must have occurred as these birds became flightless, you would uh, the things like loss of um, uh, loss of flight feathers, reduction in the forelimb, lengthening of the hind limb, reduction in the toes. All of these things you can imagine would be parallel. Uh, in if, the, if you were going from a flying chicken-like ancestor to become a giant flightless bird. So if you then separate the characteristics that support ratite uh, monophyly into cranial and postcranial, you find that the majority of the support is actually in the postcranial skeleton where and could easily be explained by morphological convergence. Not all of it though, and so this it's a it's a it's a complicated story. There's a lot of interesting morphological convergence that has occurred that's not easy to explain in this group.